Hello, everybody. This is Thomas Keegan with LibertarianProgressive.com. It is September 25th, uh, 2012, and uh, we're doing interviews with candidates uh, that are running for Congress, that are independent third-party candidates who are um, more sensible, I, I think, possibly, that, uh, th than the choices that you've been presented with from the news media, the Republicans and the Democrats. and. Uh, so the stars are lining up. The um, Congress has a 10% low approval rating, historical lows. Um, you know, they're fleecing our budgets, uh, giving away bailouts that no one agrees with, um, passing 20,000-page bills and, um, you, you know, violating the civil liberties. In fact, you, you know, if the Constitution was up for a vote and, and, and they didn't know what it was and they read it, they'd, they'd probably vote against it. Um, so that's where we're at. But... Um, we're talking to Michael Folks, who is uh, running um, uh, for the U.S. House in District Number Two in Oklahoma, and uh, he is running against. Um, uh, let's see, you do have some opponents here. Yeah, uh, Mark Wayne Mullen, a Republican, and Rob Wallace. So I guess this is kind of an open seat with no incumbents. But um, uh, Michael is. Um, it looks like you're on the Independence Party or an independent. If if you could explain that, and also tell us what got you motivated to run, uh, Mr. Folks, um, and also um, about your district number two, in case no one's you know visited um, uh, district two there, and uh, um, and just a little bit, you know, just a quick summary about yourself as well, sir. And thank you for your time today. We do appreciate um, you know you being here, so we can share um, this information with people, so they can make a more informed decision this November 6, 2012. Well, I appreciate the invitation. Uh, I'm always available to, to talk. Um, that's how I run my campaign. Uh, instead of trying to blast out a message that's funded with uh, special interest money, I've been a real boots-on-the-ground kind of person. Uh, I've spent more time visiting people uh, where they work when, when invited, uh, and at public uh, events uh, where they can expect uh, someone to, to want to, to ask them uh, what it is they really want in their, in their next congressman. Because I think that's really important. Uh, what we see a lot of is uh, the parties who have got their own agendas basically telling us what it is they think that we need to have done for us. And it's their agenda, it's not ours. So I'm always uh, really big about asking people what they want. And to be quite honest, the disconnect between what Congress, uh, Congress approval rate, uh, ratings are, it, it's just, it's quite be believable that it's, it's down to 10%. Because uh, what I hear from people is nothing like what the parties want to push out on them. Uh, yeah, this is an interesting uh, uh, district here. And to start with, it's huge. I mean, literally massive. Uh, we go from the uh, or the east side of Oklahoma. We go uh, from places uh, like Miami, which is up in the northeast corner. Uh, we go down the entire east side of the state. We, we don't get Tulsa. It has its own congressional district right around Tulsa and a, and a couple of counties right around it. But we go all the way down to the Red River. Uh, we border, uh, you know, Texas. Uh, it's really three distinct economic areas uh, that have been lumped together. Uh, by the way, that uh, districts have been redistrict uh, here since the last census. And we've got some very uh, unique uh, issues in that we've actually had a decline in population uh, from 2000 to 2010. Uh, a lot of our young people uh, grew up, uh, were unable to find work in this area, and have had to leave. So uh, we've actually got a... A, uh, uh, our demographic is actually becoming uh, uh, older, uh, which means that uh, we have uh, a lot more people that are, are at retirement age or close approaching it. And then we also have a lot of people who are under the age of 18. And our, our, we have a, a higher than national average uh, when it comes to both of those uh, because of that we have... Uh, a lot of grandparents are having to look after grandchildren. Uh, I've seen that uh, in too many homes these days. But yes, it's, uh, it's uh, an interesting race. Um, I had to, uh, uh, here in Oklahoma, when I went up to 
the Capitol to file, uh, you either file as a Republican or a Democrat. And the third choice is independent. And it's not an organized uh, party here. It simply, it really means not affiliated with either uh, national party, which really sums me up pretty well. Uh, I tell people that I'm the kind of person that I agree with some of what the Republican Party has to say. I agree with some of what the Democratic Party has to say. Uh, but neither party really represents me, and they really don't represent the people, the working people of Oklahoma, uh, which is why I was very happy to, I'm a registered independent, uh, uh, like a, even more people are in this area. Uh, yeah, and we, really... Okay. Oh, no, uh, please continue, well, sir, yeah. Well, I mean, I was trying to remember everything you asked there at the beginning. Uh, just a little bit about yourself as well, yes. And like you're saying, sure. most people are registered or, or a lot of people are registered as independents um, that you're about to say as well. Well, there's not a lot of independents. This is predominantly a Democratic area when it comes to registrations. And people will register as a Democrat simply so they can vote in the local school boards because we have uh, closed elections here. Uh, and if you can't uh, vote uh, in the primaries, uh, you know, if you're not a Democrat, there's a lot of them you can't even vote in. So a lot of people will have that affiliation. Uh, it, I think it skews the numbers. Uh, I mean, I've had numerous school boards uh, primaries that I have not been able to uh, vote for someone to help, help someone that I thought was better qualified uh, even get to the ballot because I wasn't a Democrat. So uh, it's one of the, the pitfalls of having, of, of having closed elections here. But you were asking me, you know, what was my motivation for getting started in this? Anger. It has to be anger. I, I could give a lot of other good reasons that play well, but in real honesty, it was anger. I looked at what people were doing, supposedly in our name, and it really came to a head for me when I saw... Um, Congressman Bourne, uh, right after the last election, he came out and said he voted uh, with uh, all the big uh, TCOM companies against net neutrality, which is a critical issue for anyone that understands what the Internet really does for us. Uh, for us out here, the Internet's a great leveling field. Uh, and for Dan Bourne to have... Uh, taken and voted against the interests of local business, local initiative, uh, and, and, and basically told us that net neutrality was a non-event, wasn't important to us, uh, I started ranting. I'm, and that's a nice way of putting it. Uh, my wife said that she hadn't seen me quite that animated in, in some time. But uh, when I came down off of that, she said, you know, it's not going to get any better because as long as we keep sending people up there like that who don't understand, and, and actually who, their, their goals are not our goals. And as long as we keep doing that, it's not going to get any better. It's time for you to do something about it. So I calmed down, and I went and spoke with several friends, people who have known me for 20, 30 years, and said, look, you know how I think? You've heard me. You know, we've been, we've been friends for so long. We were in college together with several of them. Uh, you've seen me grow as a person. If I run, how do you think I will do? Would you be willing to vote for me? And they said, well, depends on which party you run for. And I said, no, 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 no. I said, parties don't work. You, we know they don't work. And there's no point in trying to run if I run on a party. And, they, and my friends came back and said, well, that's the right answer right there. And that's the only way that it will work is if you'll do that, which is why I'm out here uh, being an independent. Yeah, a party is kind of like, you know, its own governments or something, and um, and, and it just, um, I mean, we already have the Constitution, and, um, you know, they have their own chairmen and, and their own rules, which um, some say are pretty corrupted, too. Um, especially this year with the, you know when Ron Paul was running in there if anyone paid attention to that but um, yeah the, this is like what you were saying like um, you wanted to um, see uh, you know what what people wanted to get around talk to the folks get their ideas um, not just kind of push your agenda I, I mean as opposed to the people 
that we've been electing into Congress right now that they're pushing their agendas. They want to get in there not to serve you or to do good or for a noble cause. They want to get in there so because like they used to work for a pharmaceutical industry and they know they're going to get a cushy job if they let certain drugs pass through and then deny other ones from passing through and that's exactly what's happening now. They want to feel good that they can, you know, have a yay or nay vote on um, uh, like, you know, body scanners at the airports that were, you know, now that, you know, that's such a no-bid contract right there. And, um, I mean, billions spent on these security systems that we don't need. But so they might say, you know, I'll vote for this. They'll, you know, they'll accept a bribe to vote for something. They might not if no one pays them. But, I mean, so from the pharmaceutical industries, the energy companies, all sorts of companies. I mean, any company that can afford a lobbyist can, you know, get paid dividends back. I mean, these people sell out. Not only are they sellouts, they sell out for, you know, nothing. I mean, they sell out for just pennies on the dollar. So, yeah, some of them get cushy jobs that they sell out, like, hugely if they're just, like, a complete plastic fake sellout but most of them i mean they'll sell out for a couple thousand dollars for their campaign they i don't know maybe they're getting something more plus they're you know insider trading the lot i mean everything they're using is for their advantage so um uh, and, and and some of these people can't even talk to the people out in public and the 10 percent i mean approval rating i that's the gallup polls we have a link to it at uh, libertarianprogressive.com and um and so uh, you know, thinking that electing more Republicans and Democrats are going to make it better, it, it's just kind of like thinking like um, that I'm going to heal my, you know, ant bites by putting my hand into a ant pile or something. Yeah, that's very much like that. I've uh, I've taken a very extreme stance when it comes to how to accept influence because we all we all make those choices in our lives. What is it around us? that we're going to allow to influence us. I mean, we do this on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, do we have some kind of a moral structure that we live our lives by? There are influences. I talked to my wife, and I said, we can either, uh, we looked at what was going on, I said, you know what's going to happen? We're going to see millions of dollars be coming into this, into this race here in Oklahoma. Because it was real obvious after the last election that uh, Dan Boren was, in fact, vulnerable. Uh, you just had to look at the numbers. He had a really poor showing against a really unknown uh, a Republican contender who hadn't done anything out here uh, and has a very extreme views. And yet he barely managed to get to six figures uh, when it came to the voting numbers. And I looked at that, and I told my wife, and said, you know, he's vulnerable. And she agreed with me. Uh, I said, you know, with that kind of vulnerability... We've got to come up with something because the parties are going to throw a lot of money at that. Not just hundreds of thousands, but there will be millions of dollars thrown into this race to keep this, this seat for one of the parties. And we looked at that and I said, the only way to do it is to refuse to compete on those terms. So yeah, Instead of we'll playing find, their game, play our game, you know, instead. Well, and that's it. My campaign, I don't know of anybody else anywhere in the country, and there probably is, but I, don't, I haven't seen them. My campaign says, please do not try to send me money. I don't need your money. I have seen a couple, I and, and, but I haven't seen any, I'll say this, I haven't seen any from, you know, Republicans or Democrats, but I have seen a couple, not all, but a couple independent third-party candidates stating that. So right. there must be something in the psyche of, you, you know, honest people. I think it is. I, I have people, I had people came up to me. I was at, um, up at Salisaw last night. We had a public uh, a candidate forum run by the Salisaw Chamber of Commerce. Really great people. This is the second round uh, of forums they did. They did another one back before the primary. Uh, but we were there last night. Um, only two of us showed up. Uh, uh, Rob Wallace was there, as, well, as I was. Uh, Mark Wayne Mullen has basically disappeared. Uh, you can't get him uh, out there to answer questions anywhere. Uh, but at the at, at this forum last night, we had people came up to me, uh, and, and they said, it's unbelievable that you're actually running uh, for this office and saying you don't need our money. I said, well, 
because that's what we we don't need your money. I'm on you need the their vote, right? That's what exactly. you need. And you need yeah. like every person to tell like if every person told 10 people that told 10 more people, yeah. uh maybe that might you know yeah. catch c catch on um it might spread yeah. the word, you know. As as I told them last night, I said thank you. And several people said, "Yeah, obviously they're not obviously, but yes, they will be supporting me in November." I said, "Fantastic. I need, I need you and 100,000 of your closest friends." To make that decision, and, and they're yeah, well, we'll we'll do what we can. And I told them, look, and if they want to spend money, I mean, you're it. spending some money. You have a nice website, vote for the Thank number four ok dot com. Vote for the number four ok dot com, and it's a nice website, and um, and and you can find all the information from from uh, interests, biography, campaign jobs uh thought of the day um issues um you know tons of things on there how to contact how to get organized i mean doesn't mean because there isn't no money that that they, there still has to be an effort um uh def yeah. definitely for sure and um sure. And, and you were in the national um re army reserves as well um which is pretty neat there's a lot of veteran independent third party candidates and and um you know, and that's where you know the fight is right now for the Constitution to defend that oath, yeah. and um, and all. That's yeah. what unites us. That's what everyone cries about when their rights are being violated. You're violating my constitutional rights. We all come back to those. Um, you, you know, it's one of the highest advanced forms of um, uh, law there is out there. I agree with that. Um, this is. I did not. I was not willing to fight for this country. To support a corporation that gambles, uh, when they lose, they go to our Congress and say, "Look, if you don't bail us out, we're not going to be able to give well, you." Well, we need to change that term. It's not gambling if you have no risk of losing, and they well, don't. Good point. Good point. Um, and that's the thing. But that's what they did. I mean, the whole financial bailout was uh, was when they told they told the parties, "Look." If we don't get bailed out on this, we're not going to be able to support your campaigns any longer. So, of course, they got bailed out. But that's not what I was willing to fight for. My father spent 20, almost 30 years uh, in the Air Force. He joined what was the Army Air Corps. I've got two younger brothers who both served in the American Air Force. Uh, this is not what we fought for or we're willing to fight for. Uh, we, we're, It's about we, the people. We're, this is a nation of people. It's not a nation of corporations. And yeah, I didn't pledge allegiance to any corporation or, or swear an yeah. oath to protect and defend any, you know, private corporation or anything like yeah. that. No way. Yeah. Well, you know, unless you get to some of these, you know, what can, and things that concern me out there is the number of uh, defense contractors that uh, got, instead of just being in support roles for moving, you know, munitions or supplies around, they actually ended up in combat situations. I mean, can you? It's hard for me to believe that if you need uh, a security detail to protect a dignitary, that our armed forces, our uniformed forces, cannot provide that detail. Truly, that is such a repugnant idea to me, uh, and it's ridiculous that we basically are hiring mercenaries to fight our wars for us. Because whenever you do that, th these people aren't, they're not fighting for patriotism. They're fighting for money. They are strictly mercenaries. And we've put the profit right back into their death and mutilation. Every time we hire a contractor to do that, we're profiting someone uh, that should not be in the profit. It, it should not be there. So it's, uh, I'm, you know, this is one of those hot topics for me. Well, uh, the Army and, and, and all the armed forces are... Um they're defending. Uh, they're defending an empire right now, and uh, it could be argued um, instead of a republic. And they want to defend a republic, I, I would think. Um, and uh, you know, we need to give them that opportunity to once again, you know, be defenders of a of a republic um, that believes in the just war theory and defending ourselves and uh, defending ourselves against these special interests that want to steal all our money. Because I mean, that's what it basically is you're either stealing or you're not stealing and um it is stealing when they're taking our money and uh and and you know uh, repressing competition they're taking money from their own competitors at that i can agree with that 
one of the things that I was asked last night, one of the questions that was asked came from the public, what would I be doing that would improve on what Congressman Bourne has done? And I said, well, uh, I said, uh, number one, I said, I'm going up there without uh, influence from special interests. Any lobbyist who walks into my office will be required to sign a registration book. It will have their name, their company, and why they were there. That book will become public property. It will be open for inspection uh, for the public at all times. So, in other words, you will have transparency back in the office. That means that you won't be wondering who I'm talking to because it's a matter of public record. Going up there without uh, big campaign contributors, I will be able to hire staff based on merit. I won't have to give out staff jobs uh, as you know for patronage, uh, which will uh, really help me uh, a great deal. Uh, and just by doing those things right there, we're going to see an improvement in government. Because when you don't have to wonder about what deals are being cut because you know who's talking to your elected representative, then you're already a step in the right direction. I'm the only candidate in this race who has not taken special interest campaign money to get to where I'm at. Yeah, and it's everywhere. I mean, every bill that's passed has tons of things added on. Every single bill nowadays does. I mean, we haven't seen, like, you know, a 20-page, an 8-page, even a 100-page bill probably for decades. I mean, you know, look at the um, Obamacare, just uh, the Christmas tree littered with um, uh, special interest deals, uh, you know, just confusing um, halls of mirrors. And uh, it, it's, um, yeah, it would make a big change um, getting someone who's not sold out there. We should elect the best candidate for the job, the best candidate. And a lot of these independent and third-party candidates like yourself that are the best choices. I mean, we're just talking common sense issues, what's in the best interest. I mean, we imagine we should try to get as many as we can this year. They're independent third-party people. I mean, no one that's like loopy or anything like that, like real people that have had a real job and um, and can add two plus two equals four, not, yep. uh, you know, five or three or something like that. I mean, they don't even know how to add and subtract um, where they are now. And uh, if they can't do that, I mean, they're signing, they're probably signing away our souls. Um, little do we know, you, you know, and uh, or they're trying to. But um, so what about the military and the budgets and, uh, you know, our, they cover so many issues. I mean, the, the military budget covers our actual budgets. Uh, a lot of people say our biggest threat is our budget um, and um, and uh, well, it also goes into foreign policy and it also goes into war and peace and, and just the process that we do to you know go to war what about like those all four issues like merch squunched up into one they are um, now uh, let, let me just put out a caution here if when when you're looking when you want to comment on foreign policy you need to be able to work from the facts, uh, and anyone who is not in the loop, anyone who doesn't receive the intelligence updates, who doesn't see uh, the uh, position statements that our military provides uh, to our Congress. In other words, if you don't know the situational details, the best you can do from where I'm standing right now is just guess. Right, uh, right, exactly. You're exactly. Absolutely, well, that's why it's called intelligence, um, and uh, well, we can't make that's a, what you, a, we can't make a fully informed decision if we don't know what we're deciding upon. Absolutely. Well, and that that's my point because I hear too many candidates, too many people who want to be elected, and they hold forth on these things, and it's real obvious that they don't have access to this. So, if what well, the way I see it, all they're doing really is just telling people what. They think you, they want you to hear. That's it. Now you what can you know where you stand on some principles, and do you think, um, and, and there's no doubt they don't have all the facts. I mean, that's exactly. for sure. And, I mean, do you think we should have all the facts, and um, do you think you should as a congressperson, and, and so on? I mean, what, you know, goes into transparency. You have to rely, you do have to rely on your experts um, to, to give you good situational awareness. Uh, you've got to be able to rely on these professionals. 
And these are professionals. These are men and women who are out there risking their lives on a daily basis to provide us with this. I've got no reason to believe that they would, in fact, be anything less than truthful because uh, if they give you a phony story, they're, they're hurting themselves. Yeah, but we uh, also want them to debate because they might have disagreements and stuff. You exactly, know. Yeah. exactly. But, in, you know, in, in practical terms, uh, yes. Uh, I wonder sometimes the motivation we have uh, with, some, uh, with our presence in some countries. Uh, for instance, right now, or just very recently, uh, DOD put out a uh, bid for contractors to go and do seismic survey in Afghanistan. Now, unless I'm way uh, mistaken, the only reason to do seismic surveys is to look for oil domes, mineral deposits. Now, this is a country we're supposedly leaving. Now, why well, would our military have an interest in that? Yeah, they found a trillion dollars worth of lithium there, and, and, and you know, there's an oil but, pipeline, I think, that goes near there. And uh, uh, those are why, questions that we need to ask why. I mean, if, if we don't know yeah. the facts, the only answer I could really give is no. I, well, why are our tax dollars being used to, to do a survey that will most likely end up profiting some private company? That's my point. Right. It's not going to be some contract that we make where we make a, a trillion dollars. Um, that's for exactly. sure. We're going to use be used as the enforcers and um, and just the, uh, y y you know, the pawns, basically. Right. Yeah. And the bank. So, you know, the, the military now, I mean, you know, what percentage of our budget is our military? How big is that? I think it's like, it's a huge percentage. I, I mean, um, I think, you, you know, just bringing it back to like 2003 levels, we could cut almost a half a trillion dollars a year, I think. Um, but, uh, and still have about 400 I mean, I mean, yeah, four hundred yeah. billion dollars, which still would be, you know, twice as much as any other country in the world. But, um, but there's, but, it, yeah. but in, in percentage, I mean, is it is it twenty percent of our national budget? I think it's or is twenty-five it or something like that, isn't it? It's a mass. It is a massive amount. And uh, we had a couple of the national candidates uh, running for president who pointed out the difference between North and South Korea uh, just here in the last forty-eight hours. And they said, you know what's wrong? Why is South Korea such uh, an economic powerhouse compared to North Korea? Well, they've taken their money and they've invested in infrastructure. They've invested in capital, human capital, uh, whereas North Korea is, in fact, spending over 50% of its budget on military. And that's the difference. Yeah, it's I different. mean, it's a tragic it's example, but that is such a clear, stark example, right? Um, and you can see and it's that. one, yeah. it's a cautionary example also, uh, because as much as I am for a strong country and a strong uh, military, I'm also a proponent of effective. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're just going to throw money at a solution uh, until you come up with a solution. Uh, you, you need to have an effective military, but you also need to be careful about what it is you're actually spending on that. Yeah, and you, should, you have to have an be, end goal, like a goal, like like this is what well, we envision the, the outcome to be, you know, yes. instead of just, like the way we're acting now, we're acting like we're undecided and that we want to um, profit special interests and bankrupt our country. If that's the goal, then um, that's how we're acting. But we're not acting as a goal that's, you know, that considers yeah. all the options on the table, that brainstorms, that, that really uses, and you know, highly intelligent yeah. people thinking about things and uh and, and and you know openness can be a, a great strength too i mean you know you look at like open source software it, it it reveals the flaws but the flaws get fixed really quickly and um yes they do and uh what so what about the um uh, I mean, just just even so, you, you know, considering all this, what about um, like, you know, the um, the NDAA which passed recently? Um, uh, it just it seems, and I say that in a broader sense of privacy because it seems like um, our privacy, like we're losing a lot of it, but at the same time, the government's gaining more privacy. It should be just reversed. I mean, we should be able to have complete oversight and freedom of information and um, accountability and, um, you know, g good representatives um, 
our eyes on the government. They're the ones, you know, should have the, the video camera should be turned around. It should be on the government um, more so than us, unless if there's a warrant, um, which, which that's even at risk for, you know, when uh, agents can write their own warrants without a judge's approval. I mean, what do you think about in that arena? Do you want, um, you know, people growing up like that in that kind of state or, you, you know, in a free country where there's a due process and respect for the Constitution? Well, I definitely am a due process uh, believer. Just because you're accused of something does not mean that you are, in fact, guilty. We're all guaranteed due process under the law. Uh, and that is something that is definitely under attack. Uh, it seems like it's under attack every time one of those legislators pulls out his pen. It seems like well, we need to make you safer, therefore we're going to remove this. But it'll only be a small infringement. Well, all of these little steps add up to major effect. Um, uh, you just ask somebody in the flying public right now, uh, you know, do they really feel any safer for all the restrictions that have been put around air travel? Uh, you know, the numbers don't really pan out, yet we spend so much money and so much effort to uh, address one small area when we neglect other areas that make life so much simpler. We have uh, open borders with really not a lot of control about who walks across them, where they walk across them, and what they're carrying when they do that. So if you over-concentrate uh, in one area, you're completely ignoring all the other places that should also have your attention same time. Yeah, I mean, the common sense, like, the, a lot of the solutions aren't policy or violating our rights. It's just better hardware and infrastructure. We have to look more at hardware instead of, um, you, you know, some of these policies, like, um, you, you know, like where they keep the luggage to have that enforced, to, you know, the cockpit doors, a way that the pilots can, you, you know, decompress the um, compartments. I, I mean, just having you know, uh, marshals, uh, air marshals, uh, things like that is more common sense. It doesn't violate people's rights, and, uh, you know, it's more practical and probably do a better job and let everyone move along their business a lot better and, and probably just, you know, working for more peace, having more trade in the world, and um, I think it makes us stronger. It, it gives us a moral high ground. Um, it's, uh, you know, it, it's the reason why we give everyone a fair trial also, partly, is because we want a fair trial because there have been houses broken into that is, is you know yeah. the wrong house there have been innocent people put in jail and and people that have been just treated like another number in fact we have the highest incarceration rates out of any nation in the entire world and um so what do you think um uh, you, you know basically about the drug war specifically um you know i think some of the other drugs might be more debatable for some but marijuana and also industrial hemp um, do you think that should be prosecuted, or how do you think we should deal with that? I think that uh, there was a, a recent uh, study that came out by a respected organization. I don't have it right off the tip of my tongue at the moment, but they came out and said what a lot of people who work in uh, work with youth, I mean, you go get the common sense answer and ask them, said, what's the number one gateway drug? Well, that'd be alcohol. It's alcohol. Alcohol is the number one gateway drug for uh, inappropriate behavior because alcohol, consumption of alcohol, uh, it, it affects your judgment and you then proceed to do things that you would not do had you not been affected by the alcohol. So that claiming that marijuana is the number one gateway drug uh, is simply protecting uh, um, an industry, the liquor industry, uh, that has special uh, privileges uh, and is well supported uh, by uh, everyday people. Nobody wants to see access to alcohol uh, uh, taken away from. Not them. again. So they'll, right. They'll, yeah, they'll pick on. Uh, they'll pick on uh, uh, you know marijuana as the alternative because you know um, you can. They point at a class, this idealistic class of people who just want to sit around. Uh, and smoke all day long and not be productive. And yeah, instead, fact, though, they would rather spend $40,000 for them in a private prison and split up, you know, yeah. um, parents with their kids and, and husbands yeah. and wives. And I mean, and there's lots of, there's lots of good research now. 
Uh, and I, what's going to be ridiculous, I think, if we proceed down the current war on drugs, is when we have all of our retirees, all of our boomers, the ones that were exposed to casual marijuana use, as they get older and as they pick up uh, all the different conditions, medical conditions that make getting older really uncomfortable, they find out, guess what? It helps with nausea. It helps with this. It helps with that. And it's natural. And aside, it, it doesn't have the same uh, noxious uh, toxicity that the mainstream pharmaceutical ju- uh, drugs have. So what happens when all of them suddenly start getting picked up for, well, having an ounce at a road stop? Are we going to start putting grandma and grandpa into our prisons? We, we already that- have. We already have. There are grandma and grandpas that have had their you know doors kicked in and, and, and that were dying of cancer and... and, and- Put behind bars. Um, that's the ridiculousness that's ridiculous. of what's going on. And some people want grapes and ferment them. Some people do it with wheat and barley. Some people just use the um, the marijuana plant. But and also another tragedy is the um, is the industrial hemp issue, where you know you can make ethanol. Um, farmers, I would love to see our farmers um, growing it like um, how Thomas Jefferson or John Adams suggested that it's it's almost your duty. I mean, we could make, you know, we want more ethanol. Yeah, we can grow a lot of ethanol and not have to, we could stop, Henry Ford said, um, you know, chopping down the forest. I mean, w- w- with that, we could use less pesticides and fertilizers um, and, uh, and, and have, you know, great yields. Um, so what about abortion? Um, well, yeah. Let me let me add to that hemp thing too, and it's, this is going to become a lot more critical as uh, as we as our climate uh, continues to warm up on us here. Now, hemp takes one third the water to mature that cotton does. Takes half of the water that uh, that corn does or soy. So what you're talking about are ever decreasing uh, resources, where we need to be rethinking how we. Uh, do our our big crops, and I know that you know industrial hemp is not going to be uh, the, the, the best alternative for cotton. It doesn't. The fibers don't act the same way. But there are a lot of other. But uses it's good for many it. other things. Yeah. Exactly. In fact, it's in exactly. some like um, I think uh, Dodge or Chrysler cars. I mean, because it makes good uh, polymers, and it also yeah. makes um, I. Uh, you know, good mixture of construction materials, I, I think, uh, need, you know, mixture. We need an open mind on this. Mm-hmm. We don't need to continue closing our minds to alternatives simply because they're not mainstream uh, ready. Yeah, We've well, got the, to start the, that conversation. The, the hemp doesn't even get um, one um, high on, like, like the marijuana plant does, and so it's it's a cousin to it, but because it looks so much the same, um, that's the reason why they said that that one's illegal too. Yet we are able to legally import it. We import a lot from Canada and other countries in the Pacific, and um, now uh, we can't even grow it ourselves. And and y- y- you know it's that's um, abominable. I mean that's just about yeah. as backwards as it gets. And uh, it, it, and at the same time, at the same time, here we are. We've got a two hundred million dollar a year. Uh, program that encourages uh, people to grow tobacco and a 50-something million dollar program to encourage people not to use it. Yeah, it just doesn't make any sense. It's crazy. It's 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 it um, it's all these special interests. I mean, hemp almost is like a genetically modified food. You you know, from nature. I mean, it's like it was designed to make ethanol and and be like a. Um, uh, you know, cash crop. Um, so, well, what about abortion, real quick, and then um, you know we'll wrap up and ask if there's anything else we forgot here. But what what is your stance? Um, what do you say? Um, that it should be the government role for um, um, you know ab- abortion. Abortion should be a personal decision. Now, I don't. Uh, I'm not a supporter of abortion, but I also came to that. Uh, decision on my own and in order for us to be a free society we need to have the freedom for each person to make that decision for themselves we're not a single culture nation we are multicultural not everyone will have the same belief systems and and I find myself even when I agree with someone with what they're saying I'm still not willing to go out there 
and try to make their belief system the law of the land because that's the step down towards uh, uh, back alley abortions and things like that. Well, if um, a, yeah, if we don't, you know, the, the, it, it, Roe v. Wade did not start abortions. Uh, reversing it will not stop abortions. Uh, it's it's going to be, uh, they will be found, they will be done. Uh, but The again, most effective way to stop pr- it would be education and also just making it a better society with yes. less crime and, and more opportunities. I mean, if... if Give our children something to do uh, besides mess around in back seats or, or wherever it is they want to go mess around uh, so that you don't have 14 or 15 year olds faced with that dilemma. Yeah, and, and have. Uh, so when I was just when I was a young person. I could go out. I, I'm in my fifties now. When I was young, I could go out and get a paper route, and I could make some money. I could go down to the local uh, corner store, and I could be an errand boy. I could be a delivery boy. Um, there were all sorts of little ways that a someone who didn't want to sit around all day could get out and do things. These days, all of those opportunities have been taken away because. It's, uh, you know, paper routes have become an adult occupation. Uh, errand boys and the such have gone away because we've got people who won't let children get into an experience where they can learn good job habits, and that's bad. Yeah, there's a lo- and, and that depends on a lot of who we elect to Congress. I mean, as far as opportunities, there's a lot of, you know, unnecessary regulations and everything's... Um, you know, it's kind of a uh, lawyeristic society, although, uh, you know, disclaimers and things are important. But um, uh, uh, there's a lot lot of things in education. I mean, we need to let, you know, people not live inside of a box. And, um, well, is there any issues I did, forgot to mention or that you'd like to expand on or we haven't had a chance to yet, Michael? I think we've covered quite a few things here. I know these are important to a lot of people. Um, my, I have a lot of, in this area, we, we desperately need more jobs that cannot be sent away. Um, I've been working with, uh, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a business consultant. I'm also on staff at a local college, but I have a business myself. And I've worked with dozens of people in small businesses over the years, helping them take their sales to the Internet. And one of the things that we always concentrated on was, well, if, the, if what they're doing only makes them a few hundred dollars a month, it's a few hundred they wouldn't have if they didn't start doing that. And we, people really need to expect to be their own entrepreneurs. You, you can't really sit and wait for some big corporation to drop a nice, cushy job in your lap. We've got to find ways you got to think way outside conventional. No, I, 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 you're so right, right on this. Yeah, keep going. Yeah, yeah, that's a good premise. I mean, people aren't well, trained in schools to even think about, you know, being their own um, boss or, you know, basically. And there's that. We, there's we a lot of that. people. And, let me, and, and on that education thing, we have a huge argument going on right now about what students should be taught in schools. The content, I mean, we shouldn't be arguing about what they're taught. We should be saying they need to be taught how to think, not what to think. Give me a reasoning person, someone who can look at a situation and think their way through it. Now, that's a bigger asset to us than somebody who can reel off 15 pages of dates and, you know, things that you get in a typical social studies class. Uh, I, you know, history yeah. is very Instead important. of the three R's, I mean, we'd still keep the three R's, but how about the um, who, what, when, where, why, and how, you know? Oh, yeah. yeah, add reasoning to the R's, you know, make it that fourth one. Yeah. So, um, you know, I've been doing things, um, I, I happen to be a beekeeper, uh, and with the decline of the, of the native, oh, not the native because they're imports, but with the decline of the honeybees, uh, there's a lot of interest. People are, are getting worried about this, and rightly so. But I've been teaching people how to become beekeepers. I've, dozens of people. I've been teaching it for three, four years now. And the nice thing about this is that the further you are away from town, out into the typically very depressed areas, 
if you become someone who can become uh, uh, a, a queen bee breeder, uh, see, we've cut off a lot of imports of bees from other countries because they have uh, their own problems with diseases. Well, right here in southeast Oklahoma, we've got a great uh, uh, environment to become one of the me uh, big sources for uh, honeybees here in the United States. And a, honey a queen bee goes for anything between 25 to $85 a piece. Well, if you can raise one queen bee, you can raise a 1000 yeah. It's not that much different. Hey, you got somebody sitting out on a couple acres in the middle of nowhere wondering how they're going to make a living, and now suddenly you're dropping that kind of income potential into them? $50,000 a year as a beekeeper. No, that, that is totally awesome. I mean, that's a great example. And I've actually thought about, um, d you, you know, uh, d you know, g ha having like a small community of bees n n near me just for fun to get some honey. Um, but, um, yeah. yeah, yeah, I think I will do that next season. Um, I got some books on it. But, but besides that, I mean, there's so many things. We, we do need to help small businesses and the entrepreneur. Like, um, we should you know help people with prop with taxes property taxes i mean we need to lower people's expenses instead of the arguments always you know people need a higher income yes i mean and and you know that has to do with education as well but um uh, we also c can help um, the government should get out of the way and and, and let p you know especially small businesses i mean because we should be dependent on corporations i mean we the, the whole mentality of the industrial revolution was these were these huge corporations and that was fine for a while it's just kind of like a football team like sometimes you might need a certain coach to get them started but then a different one to get them over to the super bowl like in the same way you know the industrial revolution definitely is important um but um if put this dependency on corporations like they're going to pay your retirement they're going to pay your health care yeah and, i mean they're just going to take care of you from cradle to grave um and now it's not going to happen it, it's important it's to you know to. It, it can be good to have a collective to get together for big projects no doubt but in a sense with the internet's revolution we're kind of returning back to where everyone was like smiths um but with you know higher technology and um and and i kind of you know you know people are more freelancers um so with that kind of environment we're gonna have to help people like that by making maybe making it easier for people to get properties properties that might not be uh, available now you know l acres of land open some up to just regular people not to contractors or things like that possibly and um and and, and just really reducing their bureaucracy and uh and taxes and letting people go out there and do whatever they want you want to open up like a whatever t-shirt thing on the side or whatever i i, I don't know would any follow-up on that sir I think it's important that we let we, we start re-enabling people because the whole emphasis from our elected officials has been to enabling uh, big business, corporations, uh, and everything is aimed at the, the so-called economies of scale. And what we're finding out is those are false economies, and what it's done is it is actually taking the skillage that made America great, and it's in the hand right now. Our skillage is dying off as our older generations, the ones that actually worked with their hands and didn't turn their noses up at any kind of work that came along. As they die off, we're losing so much. And this next generation uh, has not picked up the same kind of skills, not yet. And they're going to be forced to. And I think that's going to be an uncomfortable truth for uh, too many of our young people. Uh, and. We've I think they will succeed at it, but yeah, you might be right, but, um, you, you know, I think, um, you, you, it, because it's not just that, but with that, you, if, and if you get, like, a lot of other freedoms and, and a return to republic, respect for civil liberties, um, an atmosphere yeah. where you can succeed, it might not be such a bad thing. It's only a bad thing if we're still getting, you know, ripped off and shenagled from the special interests, you know. Then, then, then. I won't argue with that one. Yeah. Um, well, well, I appreciate the time here this afternoon. No, I know, and we're yeah, we're spending a little extra time. We'll get information. If 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 you do have another minute here, if we could ask you, if you wouldn't mind sharing with us, and um, we always close with this, like who's someone you've been thinking about recently um, that you found I'm sorry, who's what? That, that you've been thinking about recently, um, and, and and why? 
I'm sorry. I was. I got some background noise. Could you repeat that question? Yeah. Um, yeah. Who's um, you know someone either a historical figure or someone who's around nowadays oh. that's been on your mind recently? If you don't mind sharing that with us, and, and why, sir? Um, I would be hard pressed for that one. A lot of my reading has been current events. Uh, I've been looking back a lot of the founders, rather than specific people. I've been looking more at specific movements or movements in general, uh, the kind of climate that affected how people did things. Uh, I'll be honest, I've thought a lot about, uh, uh, about my, my parents. Uh, they're both dead. They've been dead a number of years. Uh, and I've, uh, I've been thinking about uh, that quite a bit here recently, uh, simply because of the kind of examples that they provided for me. My, my mother was an English uh, woman. Dad was American Air Force. Uh, back in the 50s, the expectation was that if there was ever a foreign girl that wanted to marry one of our boys, the only reason she wanted to do that was to get American citizenship. That was the, the general consensus. And my mother was a, was a proud woman, uh, all five foot three of her. And she absolutely resented that intensely and refused to apply for citizenship and was a registered alien uh, 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 my whole life. And that actually cut us out. That hurt us financially in the family because we were at overseas air bases. Uh, we were in Spain. We were in Germany. We were in England. And when you were there, a lot of the NCO's wives would usually work at one of the, the uh, base offices. Well, my mother couldn't do that. So we actually had less income than a lot of other NCO's did. Uh, well, that's a respectable, I mean, that's very, you know, very principled and, um, you know, definitely making up yeah. points there. And um, and that is, that was something that I, when I was old enough to realize what it was was going on, uh, you know, it was, I kind of realized that you know, it's really easy to tell someone, it's easy to use words, it's a lot harder to use action. And they taught me things that I don't think they realized they were teaching me, but that was one of them right there. So yeah, I'm going to go with my family on that question. Okay, yeah. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, um, because it just inspired me to think, like, you know, that's basically work out of love. You're working, doing what you love for work. You're working out of love. And, and that's kind of like what you're doing here when you're running for Congress. I can certainly hope so. Yeah. I know that we've got to change it. I've got grandchildren, and I'm scared for their futures. Uh, I'm, I cannot just stand idly by and let other people decide what their futures will be anymore. I don't trust them anymore. Well, and, and we're doing this nonprofit. I mean, you, you know, we're hoping that, um, you know, just to get the word out there and, uh, and and have these interesting interviews. And this has been very interesting. And if you want to know more, which I'm sure people would, it's votes for OK dot com. And um, so vote the number for OK dot com. And uh, there you'll see, read about Michael um, Folks. And, uh, uh, Michael, it's been a pleasure. Um, it, it's, is there any, like, upcoming events that you want to shout out real quick? Or, sh you know, should people just visit the website or any debates coming up or anything like that? Um, I will be at the RSU events. Roger State will do uh, a debate at the end of October. Uh, this coming week, um, I'll be at a beekeepers uh, meeting at McAllister. On Saturday, I plan on being up at uh, up at Miami for uh, they have a powwow going on this weekend and the fancy dance competitions on Sunday. Uh, so I'm going to go up there simply for pleasure. Uh, I'm bound to talk to some people, but uh, I'm just going up there to have a look, see at that. Uh, I, it's, I'm right in the middle of the district, uh, and I, I keep talking about the north, but uh, you know, we go all the way from one side, from the top to the bottom over here, so it's hard to get out. Well, we want to elect as many people to the Congress, no matter what district you're in, um, but especially we're talking about Oklahoma's second district here today, but even if you're not in it, you, you know, if you can find a way to support, this is going to directly affect you, and uh, so uh, it's an exciting time. It's it, you know it could be a shot heard around the world um, on November 6, 2012. 
So hopefully we make it so. And um, Michael, I'll say goodbye to you real quickly, but thank you for your time, sir, and uh, and all this information today. And um, so we, you know, they can people in the second district can make a more fully informed decision, and um, people around the country appreciate it, sir. Thanks. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, and have a good day.